I'd like to begin today, brethren, by asking a question. The question is, have you ever been cast? Have you ever been cast? It's a simple question, yet it's a question that carries a huge, huge spiritual meaning. Once again, have you ever been cast? Now, I'm not asking, have you ever had a cast, such as a plaster cast or a fiberglass cast because of a broken appendage. And I'm not asking if you've ever been cast as part of a theatrical event or possibly even a movie. What I'm asking is, have you ever been in a situation where you were emotionally, mentally, physically, or spiritually cast or felt that you were being cast? Turn, if you would, please, to the book of Psalms, to Psalm 42. Here in Psalm 42, we find the author, in this case, David. We find David asking a question of himself. Psalm 42, verse 11, we read, Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Disquieted here means to be worried or anxious. Here we find David, a man after God's own heart. Here we find David asking of his own life, asking why he was cast down. He's asking himself, David, why are you worried? David, why are you anxious over this particular situation or that particular event? The word cast, or the two word phrase cast down or casting down, reflect back to an old English shepherd's term for a sheep that's been turned over on its back and cannot get up by itself. A cast sheep is its a very pathetic sight. The sheep lies on its back, feet in the air, flaying away, struggling to right itself, but unable to do so. Oh, often it'll bleat a little while well, seeking help, but generally it lies flaying away, flaying away, frightened and frustrated. If the shepherd doesn't arrive in a certain amount of time and put that sheep back on its feet, the sheep will actually die. So we find here in verse 11, we find that David was cast down. He was worried, anxious, possibly frustrated, as is a cast down sheep that cannot write itself. So with this as a short introduction to this message, we ask once again, have you ever been cast? Well, I'm sure the answer to this is unanimous. For you see, brethren, I've been cast, and I'm sure you've been cast at some point in your life. From time to time, we've all been cast. We've all had figurative episodes of lying on our backs, feet and hands straight up in the air and wandering, how on earth am I ever going to get back on my feet? Well, there's an answer, and the answer is found right here in the book of Psalms. So turn back, if you would, please, a few pages to the 23rd Psalm. It's a psalm that we're all very familiar with. Psalm 23, I want you to take a look at verse 3. The 23rd Psalm, verse 3, reads, He restores my soul. He restores my soul. We're going to take a moment and find out exactly what this means. We're going to read Psalm 23 in its entirety, and I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. 23rd Psalm from the NLT, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close behind, you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. And in verse 6, Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Verse 3, He, the Good Shepherd, the Lord, 
He renews our strength. He restores our soul, as the New King James Version reads. In other words, the Good Shepherd, he sets us upright when we're cast down. And look at the promise that the Good Shepherd has for each and every one of those souls that he restores. That promise is in verse 6. Surely your goodness and your unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Brethren, look at the opportunity we as sheep have. Look at the opportunity we as first fruits have to live, to live in the house of the Lord forever. At that point, our souls will have been completely restored. And each of us, those called at this time, each of us, we have this awesome opportunity to have our souls restored as first fruits, to have our souls restored at that last trump, at the first resurrection. Pertaining to the Good Shepherd's restoration process found here in Psalm 23, and for the remainder of today's message, we're going to visit six aspects, and I'll be referring to them as aspects as we go through this message. We're going to visit six aspects of this psalm, each one tying directly to one of the six verses within the 23rd Psalm. And we will see that, six, that each of these six aspects, they tie not just directly to a specific verse, but they tie directly to restoration and to the restoration process. These six aspects are provision, peace, providence, protection, presence, and paradise. Once again, the six aspects are provision, peace, providence, protection, presence, and paradise. The title of today's sermon, He Restores Our Souls. He Restores Our Souls. I'm sure each of us, at one time or another, I'm sure each of us have been comforted and strengthened by the words of the 23rd Psalm. We've all been comforted at times of our castings, <clears throat> excuse me, times of our tribulations. The 23rd Psalm at times have, have comforted us in our time of sorrow, bereavement, and headache, heartache. Possibly in times when we've been disturbed, disappointed, dejected, or even discouraged. I want us to consider that it's quite possible, and this is just a speculation on my point, on my part, but it's quite possible that David was an older adult when he wrote the 23rd Psalm. For you see, as a young teenager and an older teenager, as a young adult and as an older adult, he'd been through life. He had seen tragedies and disappointments in his life. He had seen and experienced times when he was cast down. But David also, he, had to, he came to know the Good Shepherd. He had come to know the, T-H-E in caps, the Good Shepherd, the Good Shep Shepherd of unconditional love. The Good Shepherd of unconditional love, we state it that way because, as we find in verse 1, provision, I have all that I need. In verse 2, we find peace. I have rest from my weary journey. Providence is found in verse 3. I have guidance in times of confusion. Protection, verse 4. I have safety from my enemies. Presence, verse 5. I have a companion when the way is lonely. And in verse 6 we find paradise. I will live in the house of the Lord forever. With this as an introduction, a background, if you will, we'll begin to study these six aspects of restoration. And once again, those six aspects are provision, peace, providence, protection, presence, and paradise. So, the first aspect is provision. Here in the 23rd Psalm, verse 1, we read, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What we read here are the provisions given to each of God's sheep. As the New Living Translation reads, 
The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. I'd like us to consider the following. The word Lord here is the Hebrew tetragram YHWH. It's Strong's number 3068, and it's defined as self-existent or eternal. Could the Lord mention here, the shepherd here, could this be referring to the word of John 1 verse 1, the God being who became Jesus the Christ? With this to consider, place a marker, if you would please, here in Psalms, and turn to the Gospel of John, to John chapter 10, and we'll read verse 11 and verse 14. John chapter 10, verse 11 and verse 14. Now chapter 10, verses 1 through 18 is a response by Jesus to what the Pharisees in a verse in verse 40 had asked him in chapter 9. So in chapter 10, verse 11, we find Christ stating, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. In verse 14, John chapter 10, verse 14, once again Christ states, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my sheep. Keep this in mind, if you would, that Christ here in verses 11 and 14 referred to himself as the good shepherd. I want you to hold that thought and turn to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, and we'll begin in verse 11. Now, we're keeping in mind what we found that Christ is the shepherd. We found that in verse 11 and in verse 14, he refers to himself that way. And here in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, we read, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Well, faithful and true are characteristics, qualities, if you will, of Jesus Christ. We find that in Revelation 3, 14. Now, verse 12, Revelation 19, verse 12. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Verse 15, Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. We'll look at this a little further in a moment, with regards to he himself ruling as a rod of iron. Continuing here in verse 15, he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Verse 16, And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Well, here in verse 13, we read, His name is called the Word of God. Clearly, clearly refers to Jesus Christ, as is referenced in John 1.1, 1, 1, as well as John 1.14. Now with that mind, now with that in mind, look at verse 15 here in Revelation 19. Specifically the two-word phrase will rule. Once again, Revelation 19 verse 15 reads, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Will rule is Strong's number 4165. It's transliterated as P O I M A I N O. And the meaning is to tend as a shepherd, to tend as a shepherd. So we find in Christ's own words in John 10 that he is the good shepherd. And we find stated in Revelation 19, we find his name, the word of God. And that upon his return to earth in verse 15, he rules as a shepherd tends his sheep. What we see, brethren, when letting the Bible interpret the Bible, we see that the Good Shepherd of Psalm 23, inspired to be written Lord, Hebrew Y-H-W-H, Yahweh, as some would pronounce the tetragram, 
We see clearly that Lord here refers to the Word, to Christ as the Good Shepherd. Thus, Jesus Christ is the Good Shepherd of the 23rd Psalm. Back now, if you would please, to verse 1 of the 23rd Psalm. Once again, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The wording not want here carries a, a main concept of, of not lacking or, or not being deficient. But it also carries a secondary concept in that of being content with one's lot in life. Being content with one's lot in life. Content in what the Good Shepherd has provided each and every one of us. Hold your place once again, if you would, please, here in the 23rd Psalm, and turn again to Revelation, this time to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Here in chapter 3, we find a verse that is familiar to most of us. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. From the New Living Translation, we read, verse 17 of Revelation chapter 3 from the NLT. You say, I am rich, I have everything I want, I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And with this in mind, turn to the Gospel of Mark, to Mark chapter 10, and we'll read beginning in verse 17, once again from the NLT. Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 17, keeping in mind what we just read in verse 17 of Revelation 3. Verse 17 here in Mark 10, as Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 18, why do you call me good? Jesus asked, only God is truly good. Verse 19, but to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Verse 20. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Verse 21, Christ replies, Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Based on what we read in Revelation 3.17 as well as Mark 10.21, we can understand that the sheep here in verse 1 of the 23rd Psalm is referring to what the Good Shepherd knows is good for us good for us, not necessarily, and I put the emphasis, emphasis on not necessarily, the Good Shepherd knows what's good for us, not necessarily what we feel is our need. Pet's commentary on the Bible states, in reference to verse 1 of the 23rd Psalm, and I quote, I shall not want. This does not mean that he, the Good Shepherd, Will, pro will, pro will provide for the fulfillment of all our desires. It means that he will withhold no good thing from those who walk uprightly. We can compare, I'm continue, continuing to quote here, we can compare how he was able to say to Israel when they had wandered in the wilderness, you have lacked nothing. It is a reminder that he will make full provision for whatever he sees that we need. If therefore we find ourselves wanting, we should recognize that it is not because he has failed, but because our shepherd knows, he knows what is good for us, and we should therefore be content. End of quote. And once again, that's from Pet's commentary on the Bible. Since moving to Oregon, moving to Oregon in March of 2018, Shelley and I have been blessed to live in a, in a very rural setting in the Willamette Valley. A beautiful rural, rural setting just east of Salem, Oregon. We share five acres with our daughter, son-in-law, and five of our 11 grandchildren. 
Across the county road on another five acres, the owner has sheep. And over the course of some two and a half years, I've noticed how content these sheep are. As they have all the pasture, they have all the water, they have all the shelter they need. I don't ever hear them bleeding. They've ne they're never bleeding for more comfortable shelter for green pa greener pastures than what they're accustomed to. The behavior I do see is that of contentment. After grazing, they will lie down in the pasture, usually in very small groupings, and they'll sit and they'll chew the, chew the cud for hours, very content in what their shepherd has provided, which leads us directly into verse 2 of the 23rd Psalm. So back, if you would, please, to the 23rd Psalm, verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. We find here in verse 2, we find the second aspect of this psalm. We find the sheep at peace. We find the sheep at peace. Brethren, there are four requirements that must be met before a sheep can lie down and can rest, before the sheep will be at peace. Number one, they must be free from fear. They must be free from all fear. Number two, they must be free from friction within the flock. They must be free from friction within the flock. Number three, they must be free from pests. And the fourth aspect that a sheep needs to be at peace, they must be free from hunger. You know, the concept of peace as a gift of God runs throughout the entire Bible. The underlying idea being not idleness, but the freedom from anxiety. Turn, if you would, please, to the Gospel of Matthew, to Matthew chapter 11. Once again, please mark your spot here in 23rd Psalm. Here in chapter 11 of Matthew, we find the words of our Good Shepherd, penned by Matthew, words for our admonishing. Matthew 11, beginning in verse 27, once again from the New Living Translation, verse 27, Matthew 11, my Father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the Son except the Father, and no one truly knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Verse 28, then Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and I am gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. Verse 30, for my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. You see, brethren, no matter how often we're cast, no matter what our issues of life may be, we read here that our good shepherd, our good shepherd gives us rest, the peace we need. If, emphasis on the word if, if we turn to Him and give our burdens to Him, give our anxious issues to Him, give our trials and tribulations, our hurts, our desires, our wants to Him. Peace is a word that's used in Scripture in, in different ways. Generally, it denotes quiet and tranquility, but often peace refers to prosperity and happiness of life as the phrase, go in peace, or God give you peace, or peace be within this house. Another phrase is, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Paul, in his salutations of his epistles, generally wishes grace and peace to the faithful, to those he writes. Our Savior admonishes his disciples to have peace with all men and to have peace with each other. In Isaiah 66, verse 12, we won't turn there, but in Isaiah 66, verse 12, God promises His people to water them as with the river of peace, to make with them a covenant of peace. Back now to the 23rd Psalm, if you would, to verse 3. Verse 3 of the 23rd Psalm. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to His name. We find here the third aspect of the 23rd Psalm, 
that of providence. Providence. Providence is defined as follows. Number one, the act of providing or preparing for future use or application to make one ready. A second definition is foresight and care. A third definition is a manifestation of the care and superintendence which God exercises over his creatures, an event ordained by driven by divine direction. The providence we find here in the 23rd Psalm refers to godly care, for God does care for us. With these definitions in mind, turn please to the epistle to the Hebrews, to Hebrews chapter 13, and we'll read verses 5 and 6. The epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 5 and 6. Verse 5, Hebrews 13, Let your conduct be, conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Verse 6, So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? God cares deeply for each and every one of us. And as stated in verse 3 of the 23rd Psalm, he guides us along right paths. Look what Matthew has to say regarding providence, regarding God's care for us. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, please. We'll begin in verse 25. What does Matthew, under the inspiration of Almighty God, have to say about providence and God's caring for us? Matthew chapter 6, beginning verse 25. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Verse 27. Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing, verse 28? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith. Verse 31, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Verse 33, a scripture we're all very, very familiar with. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, verse 34, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. As God cares for the birds of the air, as God cares for the lilies of the fields, as God clothes the grass of the fields, our good shepherd, due to his providence, our good shepherd will guide us through our times of castings. How reassuring verse 34 should be to each of us. Once again, verse 34, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I want to interject here a short story to help us illustrate the point of providence. It's a story that maybe some of you have heard. The story reads, John, who was the only survivor of a shipwreck, now, I laugh at this every time I read it, because it's John. Why can't it be Bill or Frank or Ted? Anyway, here it's John. John, who was the only survivor of a shipwreck, washed up into a small un uninhabited island. You get the picture, a desolate South Sea island, a few palm trees here and there, and a lot of beachfront. The story continues, day after day, week after week, month after month after month, 
John would cry out to God to save him. And every day he scanned the horizon for help, but none seemed to be forthcoming. As weeks turned into months, John became thinner and thinner from a lack of food. After some 11 months, knowing that rescue just might not happen, even though nearly exhausted, John eventually managed to build a rough little hut and put his few possessions in it. A coconut chair here, a coconut table there. At least he had beachfront property. But then one day, after scavenging for food, John arrived back at the hut and found the little hut found it in flames, the smoke rolling up to the sky. The worst had happened. He was stung with grief. He was downcast. He was at a really low point. John was cast down as a sheep lying on his back with the legs flailing. Can you picture the character in this fictitious story? Can you see him lying on his back in the sand, all four appendages flying in the air, cast down and yelling to no avail, help me, I can't get up. Well, as the story goes, early the next morning, a ship drew near the island and John was rescued. John asked the crew, how did you know I was here? The crew replied, we saw your smoke signal. The moral of this short story? Well, the moral is this, brethren. Though it may not seem now through our troubles and tribulations and castings, and like John in this fictitious story, our present casting downs may be insurmountable to our future happiness. That's what we have to realize. Providence, God's care, an event ordained by divine direction can be there, God willing. Back to verse 4 of the 23rd Psalm. Verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The New Living Translation reads, even when I walk through the darkest valley. You see, brethren, the translation does not state if we walk through the valley, but the translation states when we walk through the valley. Quite a difference. Here we find the aspect of God's divine protection, similar to that of God's providence, but somewhat different. Turn, if you would, please, to the 125th Psalm, to Psalm 125, and we'll read verse 20. Seven words of verse 20 in the New King James. Once again, if you would please, the 125th Psalm, verse 20. The Lord preserves all who love him. The word preserves here this word is transliterated as S-H-A-M-A-R, and it means to hedge out. In other words, to guard, if you will. In our physical trek towards our spiritual reward, God places a hedge around us. But that hedge is to His purpose, and that's what we have to come to understand. At times we are cast down, but our ever-loving shepherd lifts us back on our feet, points us in the right direction, and allows each one of us to continue our journey to his purpose, for his purpose. While cast, we may feel as though we are flailing. We may feel as though we're spinning our wheels, so to speak. But our shepherd, our good shepherd, renews our strength. He preserves us protects us along right paths, bringing honor, bringing honor to his name. Back to the 23rd Psalm, verse 5. Verse 5 we read, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Here we find the Good Shepherd's presence, the fifth aspect of the psalm. Here the Good Shepherd prepares a feast for each one of us. 
Note here that our enemies are in our presence, but who is there with us, ready to anoint each of us? Our Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd companionship with each and every, the Good Shepherd's companionship with each of us, His presence with each of us, should be very reassuring to each of us. I appreciate the NLT wording here in verse 5. Verse 5 from the NLT. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Oh, once again, brethren, I ask you to hold that thought. Hold the thought that the Good Shepherd is present even when our enemies are about us and turn to the 139th Psalm to Psalm 139. Here in Psalm 139, we'll begin reading in verse 7. And once again, from the New Living Translation. Psalm 139, verse 7. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. Verse 8. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. Brethren, do you see God's presence in these verses? Verse 9, If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. Once again, brethren, God's presence. Verse 11, I could ask, that, I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness I cannot hide from you. God's presence. Continuing in verse 12, To you the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same as you. You, are made all the, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Brethren, understand this verse. God's presence with us before we're even physically born. Verse 14, Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, and I was woven together in the dark of the womb. God's presence. You saw me before I was born. God's presence. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. God's presence. Verse 17. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I cannot even count them. They outnumber the grains of the sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. God's presence, brethren, God's presence. The presence of our Good Shepherd is sown within each of these 12 verses. I want to take a few minutes and review a few examples of some who, who came to understand the presence of God in their lives noting that they too experienced casting downs in their lives, yet they came to understand that God was right by their side, that God was present in their lives. Turn first, if you would, please, to the book of Exodus, to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33, we'll read verse 15. Moses was convinced that without God's presence in his life, he was used, it was useless for him to attempt anything. So beginning in verse 15, <clears throat> excuse me, we read, Exodus chapter 33, verse 15, Then he, Moses, said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. Verse 16 from the New Living, How will anyone know that you look favorably on me on me and on your people, if you don't go with us. For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. When Moses was speaking to the word of the Old Testament, he was saying, Lord, if your presence is not with me, then I'm not going anywhere. I won't take a single step unless I'm assured that you're with me. Well, you see, brethren, Moses knew it was God's presence in Israel that set the people apart from all other nations. And the same is true for the church today, for each of us today. Moses didn't care how other nations received their guidance. 
Moses didn't care how other nations formed their strategies. Moses didn't care how other nations ran their governments or directed their armies. Moses said, we operate on one principle alone. The only way for us to survive our castings down is to have the presence of God with us. And brethren, that should be the same attitude we have today. Here in Exodus 33, beginning in verse 12, we read, Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you also have found grace in my sight. Now therefore, verse 13, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you, and that I may find grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. Verse 14, And he, God, said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. What an incredible promise, brethren. The Hebrew meaning here for rest, here is a comfortable, quiet rest. God is saying, no matter what enemies or trials we face, no matter when, how often, or to what degree our castings may be, each of us, each of us will be able to find a quiet rest in our Good Shepherd, in God. If we have Christ's presence in our lives, we will experience God's divine presence. We'll have a peace and a calm with no fretting, no anxiety, no running to and fro, no sense that the sky is falling. The sky is falling like Chicken Little would have everyone in the barnyard believe. We need not feel as though we are flat on our backs with our, four failing, with our legs failing away, kicking in the air. We can be at rest, each of us, knowing that God has everything under control, always has, does, and always will. For you see, brethren, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Take, for instance, the life of Abraham. God's presence was so evident in Abraham's life, so evident that even the heathen around him recognized the difference between their lives and his. In Genesis chapter 21, verse 22, we read, and you don't have to turn there, I'll just read it. Genesis chapter 21, verse 22, we read, And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, spoke to Abraham, saying, God is with you in all that you do. We find here this heathen king saying, Abraham, there's something different about you. God guides you, preserves you, and blesses you wherever you go. Turn, if you would, please, to the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua, the chapter 1. We'll read verses 5 and 6. Here in Joshua chapter 1 and in verses 5 and 6, we read that God promised Joshua that, that no enemy would stand against him when God's presence was with him. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, we find, verse 5, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Verse 6, Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. The lesson for each of us today, due to God's Spirit being present within us, we can be strong. We can be courageous because no enemy, no enemy, brethren, no enemy can harm us. In Judges chapter 6, in verse 12 and 14, we read regarding Gideon. And once again, you don't need to turn there if you don't want to. In Judges chapter 6, verse 12, we read, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, appeared to Gideon, and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. In verse 14, Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? The phrase, this might of yours, M-I-G-H-T, this might of you refers to verse 12, that the Lord is with you. 
Do we fully understand what God is saying? Gideon, there's a might in you that is so powerful, it can save Israel. And that might is my presence. God wanted to prove to Gideon what any person can do with the Lord's presence with him. And brethren, that story of Gideon, that might can be with us as well. Jeremiah is another example. God warned Jeremiah that the whole nation would turn against him and reject his prophecies. Yet God made him a promise. Turn, if you would, please, to Jeremiah chapter 15. We'll read verses 20 and 21. I'll be reading from the New International Version. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 20 from the NIV. I will make you a wall to this people, a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you, for I am with you to rescue and save you, declares the Lord. Verse 21, I will save you from the hands of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the cruel. God was saying, it doesn't matter if the whole country turns against you, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, it doesn't matter how cast down you may become or may feel. All that matters is that my presence is with you. Be confident. Be confident. I'm with you. And again, brethren, that admonition is for you. That admonition is for me. Another example is found in Isaiah. Look what we find here in Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 5, New Living Translation. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1. But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you says, Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. Verse 3, For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt as a ransom for your freedom. I gave Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Others were given in exchange for you. I traded their lives for yours because you are precious to me. You are honored and I love you. Now the first part of verse 5, Do not be afraid, for I am with you. God was saying, with my presence abiding with you, you can go through any flood, you can go through any fire, and you can survive. Yet you won't merely survive, you'll be blessed and favored through it all, because God's presence, His presence is with you. And that presence, brethren, can be with each of us. These Old Testament passages which we just referenced Brethren, they're not dead letter stories. They're meant to encourage and exhort us to seek God's presence in our lives. We can thank God for what his presence did for Moses. We can thank God for what his presence did for Abraham and Joshua, Gideon, Jeremiah, and all of Israel. Yet each of us, each of us, brethren, each of us has a powerful testimony in what God's presence can do for each of us guiding our lives, opening doors, moving obstacles, making us fearless, even though there have been times, and for some of us, many times, when we were cast down, flat on our backs, hands and arms, feet and legs flailing about. Yet, each time, God sets us up upright, for he is, this, each, he is with each of us, on this physical journey towards our spiritual goal. Yet each of us must come to understand that there's, con there's a condition attached to getting and maintaining the presence of God in our lives. God attaches a condition to His presence in our lives. This condition is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 15. 2 Chronicles chapter 15. In the previous chapter, King Asa has led the armies of Judah to a great victory over Ethiopians' million-man army. Yet Asa testified it was God's presence that had scattered the enemy. 
We'll pick up the story in 2 Chronicles chapter 14, and we'll begin in verse 11. Verse 11 of 2 Chronicles chapter 14. And Asa cried out to the Lord of God and said, Lord, it is nothing for you to help, whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, O Lord, our God, for we rest on you, and in your name we go against the multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. Note the wording here. Asa did not cry out, do not let the man prevail against us. But rather, Asa cried out, do not let man prevail against you. Continuing here in verse 12. So the Lord struck the Ethiopians before Asa and Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. As Asa and his armies led the triumphant procession back to Jerusalem, a prophet named Azariah met them at the city gate. And Azariah had this message from God, beginning here in chapter 15, verse 1. Now the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. And he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time Israel has been without the true God, without the teaching priests, and without law. But when in their trouble they turned to the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found by them. That was verse 4. Here, brethren, is where we find the condition of getting and maintaining the presence of God in our lives. The Lord reminded Asa, point blank, with no holds barred, Asa, don't ever forget how you got this victory. You sought me with all your heart, turning wholly to me when you were in trouble. And I sent my presence to you. It was my presence that put your enemies away. Well, brethren, each of us can have the abiding presence of the Lord in our lives if we'll simply just seek Him and ask Him to be present in our lives. In verse 2 of chapter 15, we find the Lord will be found of you. The Hebrew word found here is matza, M-A-T-S-A, meaning His presence coming forth to enable and to bless. In short, this verse tells us, seek the Lord with our whole heart, and he will come to you with his presence. Indeed, his presence will be an almighty power that enables and, 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 and lives with each of our lives. When we're upright, standing on our two feet, when all is going well, our shepherd is with us. And when the reverse is true, when we're cast down, hands and feet floating in the air, incapacitated as the woman in the ad yells out, help me, help me, I've fallen, I can't get up. When we're cast down, the same loving, the same concerning, the same guiding, protecting, and providing God, the Good Shepherd, He's there with us, and He's there for us. He is our ever-present companion. Back to the 23rd Psalm, the sixth verse of Psalm 23. The sixth verse reads that each of us have an opportunity to experience paradise. Now, paradise sounds sort of worldly Christian, but let's dig a little deeper into the promise that we find here in verse 6 of the 23rd Psalm. Once again, verse 6, Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. The key phrase here is, we'll live in the house of the Lord forever. Based on that phrase, I want to read a couple of paragraphs from Fawcett's Bible Dictionary under the heading Paradise. Quote, An earthly paradise can never make up for losing a heavenly paradise. And he references Revelation 2, 7 and Revelation 22 verses 1, 2, and 14. The quote continues, Paul in a trance was caught up even to the third heaven into paradise. In Eden, 
Adam and Eve lived solitary, exhibiting the perfection of the individual. The heavenly home shall not be merely a garden, but a city, a perfect communion of saints. And he references, Fawcett references, Hebrews 12, 22, Revelation 21, verses 1 and 22. Quote continues, Earthy cities such as Nineveh, Babylon, rested on mere force. Athens and Corinth, on intelligent art and refinement, divorce from morality. Tyre on gain, even Jerusalem on religious privileges, more than on love, truth, righteousness, and holiness of the heart before God Almighty. But the coming city, the new Jerusalem, but the coming city shall combine all that was excellent of the first Eden with the perfect polity, that means organization, that rests on Christ, the chief cornerstone, in which symmetry, grace, power, and the beauty of holiness shall shine forever. End of quote. From this dictionary definition and explanation, I want to visit the scriptures quoted in this particular article by that we just quoted from Fawcett. And as we do, I want us to reflect on the six, verse 6 of the 23rd Psalm. And once again, verse 6 in the NLT, Surely your goodness and failing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. With that, we'll turn and go through a few of these references that Fawcett brought out in this commentary. First, Hebrews chapter 12, we'll begin in verse 18. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18 from the NLT. You have not come to me, I'm sorry, you have not come to a physical mountain, to a place of flaming fire, darkness, gloom, and whirlwind, as the Israelites did on Mount Sinai, for they heard an awesome trumpet blast and a voice so terrible that they bade God to stop speaking. They staggered back under God's command. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. Verse 21, Moses himself was so frightened at the sight that he said, I am terrified and trembling. Those who have been selected to participate in the New Covenant experience a totally different relationship with God than those involved in the covenant at Mount Sinai. It's a very different covenant. The primary emotional impact experience at Sinai was fear. Verses 18 through 21 summarizes the fear experienced by those who experienced the Sinai covenant itself. Now in verse 22 of Hebrews 12, Paul contrasts the experience of those with whom the new covenant is made. Verse 22, know you, in other words, those of the new covenant, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering. Those with whom the new covenant is being made approach the spiritual aspects of God rather than the physical mountain. Mount Zion refers to the place of God's throne, which is surrounded by tens of thousands of angels. The city of God, New Jerusalem, is the place of residence sought by Abraham and prepared by God for all who participate in the first resurrection. Keep in mind the city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem, and turn please to Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. Again, we're going through these verses that were referenced by Fawcett. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. He who, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, Revelation 21, verse 1 and 2. Now I saw a new Jerusalem and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, verse 2 of Revelation 21, Then I, Joss, John, saw the, city, the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven from God, prepared as the bride adorned for her husband. Now chapter 22, beginning in verse 1, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was a tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. 
And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no more night. They need no lamp or light of sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Now verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of the city. Now regarding verse 4, and verse 4 once again states, they shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. Question, who is this verse in direct reference to? Whose face shall they see and whose name will be on their foreheads? We'll turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 14. We'll read verse 1. Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. We're answering the question, whose face shall they see and whose name shall be found in their foreheads? Revelation 14, verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Here we find the answer as to whose name is in their foreheads. Verse 4 of Revelation 22 is in direct reference to the Father. Thus the 144,000 will see his face, the Father's face. Now it's very interesting that John, here in Revelation, it's interesting that John was inspired to write that they shall see his face. Emphasis on shall see. I'm going to digress for a moment and address the following. Why would John, why would John have been inspired to write in the future tense as they shall see his face, a direct reference to the Father, if any of the 144,000 had already seen the Father's face? Was John inspired to write in this format because no one prior to the first resurrection will have seen the Most High God? who today we address as the Father? Consider Jesus Christ's own words from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 46, where Christ states, Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. The New Living Translation reads, Not that anyone has ever seen the Father, only I, who was sent from God, have seen him. John had also written in John chapter 1, verse 18, as well as 1 John chapter 4, verse 12, that no one has seen God. Here in Revelation 22, verse 4, he brings to the fact, or he brings to light the fact that the 144,000, those of the first resurrection, will see the Father's face. Based on Hebrews chapter 11, we find that those such as Abraham, Jacob, Moses, and of course, many, many others of the Old Testament did not receive the promise, as we read in verse 39. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39, I'll just reference it. And all these having obtained a good testimony through faith did not receive the promise. Vine's expository dictionary of the Bible words has this to say about the word faith. Faith, translated as P-I-S, transliterated as P-I-S-T-I-S, -I -S, is defined as, quote, primarily a conviction based upon hearing. A conviction based upon hearing is used in the New Testament always of faith in God or Christ. I'm continuing the quote. The dictionary continues, the word is used of trust, trustworthiness, what is believed, the contents of belief, a ground for faith, and assurance, a pledge of fidelity. The dictionary states the main elements of faith in its relationship to the invisible, invisible God, as dis distinct from faith in man, are especially brought out in the use of this noun. End of quote. Interesting wording in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39, in that those individuals listed obtained a good testimony through faith, through faith, a conviction based upon hearing, a conviction based upon hearing, not 
through sight, not through seeing. And these patriarchs, these examples for each of us, those with convictions based upon hearing, not through sight, these patriarchs will finally see the Father as we just read moments ago in Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, and Revelation chapter 22, verse 4. Digression complete, back to Psalm 23. Verse 6 of Psalm 23 gives us insight to our opportunity to enjoy paradise, to live in the house of the Lord forever. And that forever means, brethren, we'll never be cast down again, never again. So today we have seen the wonderful facts that the Good Shepherd of the 23rd Psalm, the Good Shepherd gives provision. We have all that we need. The Good Shepherd gives peace. We have rest from the weary journey. The Good Shepherd has providence. We have guidance in times of confusion. The Good Shepherd gives protection. We have safety from our enemies. The Good Shepherd of the 23rd Psalm gives presence. We have a companion when the way is lonely. And the Good Shepherd promises paradise. We have an opportunity, brethren, to live in the house of the Lord forever. As we begin con to conclude, turn, if you would, please, to Revelation chapter 21. I want to read verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. In verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Brethren, can we fully comprehend, can we fully understand the joy here? The days of human, human casting downs will be gone. The family of God will be complete. And every member of the family will spiritually walk upright, will walk upright forever and ever. But the first fruits for the 144,000, those allowed to rule with Jesus Christ during the millennium, their casting down days will come, their, their casting days will come to an end at the first resurrection. That's when the kingdom begins for the 144,000, brethren, and we have that opportunity before us. Turn, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we begin reading in verse 51 from the NLT. 1 Corinthians chapter 50, 15, verse 51. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. Verse 52. It will happen in a moment, in a blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we, will, and we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Brethren, our casting days will be a thing of the past. Never again, never again will we be cast down, laying flat on our blacks, backs, wondering if we'll ever get back on our feet. Whether we are resurrected to a life or changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, our forever and ever begins at the last trumpet blast, when the Good Shepherd restores our souls for all eternity. Two last references. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 57 and 58 from the New Living Translation. Verse 57, 1 Corinthians 15. But thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, brethren, our casting days will be a thing of the past through the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, verse 58. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. For you see, brethren, he, 
the Lord, the Good Shepherd, our Shepherd, He restores our soul.